Thank you very much, everybody, to come into this session, The Value of Volunteers in Heritage Tourism. My name is Rosie Wiley, and I'm from Historic Environment Scotland. I'm their National Tourism and Community Manager. Uh, I have quite a wide remit across the country. Um, we have a team of regional managers, and our um, remit is focused on our properties and care. Now, in Historic Environment Scotland, we have over 300 properties in care, and they range from 78 staffed sites, which are uh, classed as our visitor attractions, where they're paid admissions, to unstaffed properties, key keeper properties, where we work with a range of uh, community-based key keepers who provide access for us, and then a range of different partnership sites where we work with groups in the local community who help support us with visitor access or provision of guided tours, such as the Friends of Keneal, who are joining us here today. So today's structure is going to start with me giving a presentation on the journey of Historic Environment <coughs> Scotland and where we are in terms of um, developing our volunteer programme. Uh, we're quite early on in our journey of that. And then we'll be followed by Edinburgh Living History, who are here, um, and they will be talking about uh, their experiences of costumed interpretation, uh, storytelling in the Edinburgh area. And then it'll be Friends of Keneal, who will be sharing with us uh, the big plethora of activities <laughs> that they deliver in the Bowness area. But the theme that runs through this whole session is about... Um, it's, it's volunteers who are engaging in visitor activities um, and are part of Scotland's wider tourism offer in terms of heritage. So there'll be time at the end for Q&As. Now you'll see in the programme that we just asked if anyone also has any questions on anything about um, designing programmes for volunteers that would be engaging visitors or general volunteer management or development. So um, we are a small group, so I think that if we make this informal, if you have questions as we're going along, um, I'm certainly happy in my session for people to just raise their hands if there's something that crops up the time, or just um, save your answers till the end. So does anyone have any questions uh, before we get started, or any core things that they would like us to cover? No? Okay, so we'll get started. So volunteering. Raise your hand if you either have volunteered or you currently volunteer in something. Okay, just about everybody um, in the room does. And what about if you uh, represent an organisation that engages volunteers? Yep. So I was at the ASFA conference yesterday, the Association of Scottish Visitor Attractions, um, and there was uh, over 100 people there. And when I asked those same questions, everybody in the room, at the first question about have you volunteered or are you volunteers, they raised their hands. Um, and it's an absolute key, um, important topic. And I'm going to be talking as well a little bit about research that we've carried out about volunteering in the historic environment and the challenges around that, the health of that, the stats around it, and some actions that organisations can work together to take forward. So... Have um, people here heard of volunteering in the historic environment, the research piece from 2015? If you can raise your hand. You think so? Yeah. Um, you would have heard about it at the June Symposium um, at the museum. Um, so I'd be interested to know then, uh, for those of you who did raise your hands then, where did you hear about the research? On your website. You saw it on the website? And is that just through having a look around the website or were you actually going to seek it out? No, I just was looking around Came across it? Uh, I think I remember it from the managers conference. At the end shed. Where did you? Me? Yep. Oh, New Zealand's got a response. Yep, okay. Who else? Did you say you'd heard of it? No, no. Okay, so uh, we commissioned Volunteer Scotland in 2015 to carry out this piece of research here. Um, now, a lot of the qualitative quotes that came back, uh, this is one here that's a good summary. So volunteers want to participate in a worthwhile, well-run organisation. You want a task they enjoy, where they help meaningfully, they need to be appreciated and thanked, as well as encouraged. So if anybody is thinking about developing a programme or making any changes or anything, then uh, we would strongly recommend really that those are the principles that you would take and you would build from them. Now, bearing in mind that this is a sample size here of 181 organisations, for this piece of research we put together a database that had over 1,000 heritage organisations that engage volunteers in it. So 180 respondents. 
um, coming back that 17,100 um, volunteers within those organisations. Um, you can see there a lot of uh, contribution of volunteer days, averaging seven days uh, per annum. Friends of Keneal and Edinburgh Living History, how many days a year do you think you would volunteer? What do you think? Rough ballpark? Um, we have eight open days, but then we've got all the management meetings and uh, planning. Um, so I would say, you know, a good 24, 30 days. 24, 30 days? I think about 40. Yeah. Big commitment. Yeah. yeah. And what drives that? Uh, <laughs> we love dressing up. You love dressing up? So the passion for what you do? Yeah. The hobbyist, the absolute enjoyment. What about yourself? I, I think it's uh, keeping our history alive. Keep the history alive. And what about other people that raise their hands that they actively volunteer at the moment? I will. Uh, at the moment, I'm, I volunteer as a water mistress for a youth theatre. Mm -hmm. um, and my primary drive for that is my love of um, dressmaking, sewing, crafts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So being able to indulge and engage your passion, but also for something that's, yeah. that's useful? Yeah. Is that, yeah? What about anyone else? I volunteer being on the sector, actually. Um, sit on board of, you know, directors on various committees mm -hmm. in the community, and also the room, mm -hmm. you know, and we attend meeting coffee, uh, coffee mornings, organizing that, and doing fundraising and things like that, and attending meetings and things that for me, there is a lot of so is that about giving something back and supporting vital services? Yes, that's there. Yeah. It's also about you know, lending my own skills and experience. So that's your motivations for yeah, it? That's, that's passion. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, volunteering, it's always been part of something that I've done. Um, started off when I was 18 in the Queensland Fire and Rescue Service. That was my first um, easy exposure in a similar circumstance to you to uh, the role of volunteers in absolute vital services. Um, I've been a tour guide, volunteer rangers, uh, volunteer at, at diff a variety of, of horse shows and such like because that's my passion, that's a social thing. Um, so big different ranges um, and the motivations for volunteering. Uh, staff to volunteers here at 1 to 1.6, uh, that is a big indication of the absolute crucial role that volunteers play in the sector and the economic value there is 17.5 <coughs> million and that's based on the average um, weekly wage. So, um, and to give you an idea of, of broad from the sector, what percentage do you think from the, the household survey in 2016, what percentage of adult respondents do you think volunteer in percentage? That's a difficult one because a lot of people volunteer but don't realise they're volunteering. So it's formal volunteering. Yes. Yeah. Two thirds. Two thirds. It's twenty eight percent. So that's one point two million people in two thousand and sixteen in Scotland were engaged in some sort of, of formal volunteering. Okay, so what about the richness? Now, last time I showed this slide, Adrian was in the audience, <laughs> and Adrian picked up, and so were you, and you both actually picked up, I think, on a couple of roles, I'm pretty certain, that aren't included in this. So there's a couple of familiar faces down in the bottom right-hand corner in this. So um, Historic Environment Scotland, we are part of a network called the Heritage Volunteer Organisers Scotland. So if you are part of a heritage group and you're interested in joining the network, I can give you more information on it or go on to the website and join the newsletter and start to get involved. So at the start of 2017 for the Year of History, Heritage and Archaeology, as a network, we kind of thought, well, actually, there isn't a lot of strong imagery that collectively captures the activities in the sector. So what could we use jointly in recruitment, um, in reports, up on the website, on social media, on posters, just a big variety of stuff. What can we capture? So you can see here, um, we tried to get as, as wide as we could from the member networks that were able to, to participate there. So. You can see uh, these are all absolute vital roles and there is a mix there of the behind the, the scenes roles, the curatorial, the collections, um, event volunteering, so that's something that there's a, a growth area in, the interpreters, tour guides, explainers, living history, so looking at the visitor engaging roles there. Um, committee members, raise your hand if you're part of a committee. Yeah, yeah, okay. And is that in a voluntary role? 
Yes, but this is in the publishing field in which I'm. So you do do some current volunteering, because I think you didn't raise your hand. I didn't, but I guess I do. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, but 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 committees and boards, etc., is sometimes one of the rules people don't think. Well, that is voluntary, but it absolutely is is voluntary. Um, Gardeners, Junior Rangers, uh, that of course is going to be an important programme next year in the Year of Young People, uh, showcasing what our, our youth can do and also enabling the sorts of activities. So what have we missed out there? I think you missed out on not just the activities, but range of people, other people who are not necessarily white. So that is one of the challenges that the research, volunteering in the historic environment, one of the outputs was that there is a lack of diversity in volunteers as an audience in the historic environment. So I'm going to be talking about the research and how we actually can take forward collectively as a sector a bit of a strategy and approach to try and actually improve that. So the great, I know yeah. some, I know yeah. most of them yeah. that but you're, Yeah, no, but you're absolutely right. And that was um, from organisations that came forward and they are all actually volunteers. So that is a very small but a representation in terms of the work that we're trying to do. Um, so marketing, volunteers, administration, volunteers, uh, photographer, that was a, an important one that we missed out on, and um, digital, uh, social media. So, you know, there's a lot of ones, um, but hopefully that gives a bit of a representation there um, of the, the richness. So in terms of historic environment Scotland, so that's what um, my presentation here would be focusing about is really about showing the approaches and organisation that we are taking um, on a quality, not quantity approach. Now, um, before we were Historic Environment Scotland, we were two organisations, Historic Scotland and RCAMS. Now, Historic Scotland traditionally was a um, executive agency of the Scottish Government, so we, will, we were a civil service, so we were there for employment of the nation and uh, volunteer development and programmes wasn't one of the core functions um, of the organisation. We did have a volunteer programme, but it wasn't high on the agenda, so it wasn't really until we were heading towards the new organisation and thinking about our wider participation and our role in that um, and deciding it was time really to, to take an approach to volunteer development. So currently here, though, people are often actually surprised at this list, and they're not always so aware of the different types of roles that we have. So you can see there our board, and we've uh, talked about that and, and the, the, the crucial role, and actually a lot of people are involved in committees or, or boards and don't necessarily see that as a, as a voluntary role. Our ranger service, so you can see there those images, that is uh, one of the longest standing programmes as is the Archives Data Survey and Recording Volunteers. So they are based at John Sinclair House. The Ranger Service is based in Holyrood Park, Linlithgow Peel, and up in Orkney. So those programmes have all been in effect for over 20 years. Um, and we've been building on that the summer guides. Uh, has anyone been to Linlithgow Palace and had a guide from some of our young volunteers? How did you find that experience? It was really good. Yeah. It was great as well. Pardon? costumes were great as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the summer guide programme, that is for first year high school students at Linlithgow. Um, and they actually have to audition to that. And they, they audition and they do that after they have been a junior guide as part of their curriculum when they've been in primary seven. Um, and we're doing more and more with the junior guide programmes throughout the country. The engine shed, that's a new volunteer programme that was introduced in July when the engine shed Open. So if you do, if you haven't been to the engine shed, I'd strongly go. Uh, I'd recommend going for a visit there to the conservation centre, and you'll meet the volunteers there who are involved in all sorts of things: meeting and greeting, guiding, the interpretation side of things, delivering informal learning activities, uh, event volunteering. So they're a team of individuals who um, have come along, and they have a range of different skills rather than just focusing on one. Partnership sites. Um, so we've talked about <coughs> Keneal House, and I don't want to go into too much detail on that because you're going to be presenting on that, but we have a range of groups throughout the country. And then community projects as well, of course. So Scotland's Urban Past, for example, where we engage groups who have their own volunteer programmes. So in 2016, Historic Environment Scotland engaged 380 volunteers and contributed 1,225 days. And those numbers are gradually growing. Um, but as I've said, we are not focused... Um, uh, on numbers. For us, it's about the quality of the experience, the quality of the programme, building that foundation um, and making sure that our visitors, our volunteers and our staff are all fully engaged um, and supportive and enjoying the programme. So, uh, as I've said there, um, quality, not quantity, that's very important for us as an organisation. 
collaboration, both internally and externally. So I talked there about the um, Heritage Volunteer Organisers Scotland. We're involved in our place and time, uh, the national strategy for the historic environment, our working group in that. But also internally, it's been really important for us. We've um, it's been a very good project to work cross directorate and cross teams. So we have support, for example, for our marketing teams. They help us with the recruitment messages. Um, they help us with the advertising of the tours. Our communications colleagues, our health and safety colleagues, conservation colleagues. Everybody has had to work together to make sure that we shape um, a, a volunteer program that is of a safe standard, um, that uh, has the, the right messages, that is appealing to people, um, and also uh, we have done um, a lot on it in terms of surveying um, and understanding people's um, how people are enjoying the program, but that's also internal as well as external. So our staff have been very involved and on board in terms of the consultation, the communication. Uh, when we first decided we were going to do volunteer development, one of the first things that we did was have a consultation with the trade unions. Um, because what was crucial to us is that we didn't threaten staff members at all. So if that is something that people are thinking about doing in terms of enhancing um, and involving more volunteers, is really think about everyone who needs to input into it um, and any issues early on where people might feel uneasy or threatened about it. So. Uh, the staff have all been involved in it and the unions um, were happy and agreed with the approach that we've taken and the approach that we're taking is that volunteers engage with us um, for their motivations it's primarily for our own way of engaging the communities at the sites and it's about bringing added value to the volunteer experience um, sorry the visitor experience and if our volunteers were to cease to exist overnight the actual core business functions wouldn't be negatively affected in terms of the organisation, but the visitor offer would be. Um, and I think, you know, Keneal House is an absolute example of that. If you were to cease doing the tours at Keneal House, we could still provide the access, but actually we couldn't have the access into the top rooms, there wouldn't be the interpretation and all the information that you provide for the visitors. Um, tailored training, we've developed that all in-house to fit our own business needs. So we will do uh, volunteer coordinator training ourselves um, that works out for our properties and our monument managers as stewards there. We also do our own tour guide training, we do our own handling collection box training for the volunteers and we will shape that and tailor that if people have uh, specific skills that they want to develop. And ongoing evaluation, as I say, we've um, talked to the volunteers, the staff and the visitors um, as we've moved forward. And we've done it in a pilot approach and that's been in three phases. Uh, so the first phase, uh, well actually, sorry, before I go on to the phases, um, in terms of world class welcome, so the organisation, um, that is what we strive to achieve in terms of our standards. And then so individuals that volunteer with us out of our properties or at our events, then uh, we would um, want individuals, before they think about uh, signing up to volunteering with us, to have a reflection, read through these attributes. So we would want individuals to feel that they are approachable, friendly and enthusiastic, able to work in a team, able to act on instructions, including health and safety, so that's very important for us, of course. Um, have excellent communication skills, can provide directions and guidance to the public as required. So do you think that we've missed out any key attributes there? No? I think they're all there. Think they're all there? Good. Um, so we <coughs> have a competency-based approach. We always have had that as an organisation. Um, so we do ask that volunteers can give examples um, of contributing to an existing service of high quality, that they can work in a team and that they can communicate effectively. Now if you're a volunteer within the organisation and you've come through that recruitment process, you'd be able to go and volunteer anywhere else in the organisation. So um, the principles of having those competencies is that people can have any training and development and coaching that they need based on that. We used to have uh, long application forms. Um, you used to have to give examples of five competencies. So part of the pilot and development was to completely refine that. So you don't have to fill in an application form. Instead, you would be invited to a taster session as a group. You'd meet other prospective volunteers. You'd meet the site teams. You'd go on a tour. You'd find out about the activities. You can have a look at the um, clothing, the handbooks, ask us any questions. And then if after a taster session you decide that the organisation is the right fit for you, 
then you would come to an informal interview and you would just verbally talk through that um, with the volunteer coordinator. We do score it um, so that it is open and fair and sometimes we have more applications than number of volunteers that we could reasonably support through one of our site programmes. Um, so that's really our, our way of making sure that um, people have um, accurate expectations of the organisation and they understand what our expectations would be of the individuals. So Duff House, who's been to Duff House before? So Duff House is up in uh, Banff and if you haven't been before then uh, I would strongly recommend going. Um, you can see here this is one of our tour guides starting off the model and phase one of the pilot started off at Duff House and our decision was to work with a volunteer group um, that already existed within the organisation as part of our partnership. So this is the Friends of Duff House here. Um, and for a few years, the Friends of Duff House wanted to be able to give tours, but we didn't have the structure to be able to enable that and make sure that it was of the standard um, for the volunteers and the visitors it needed to be. So we worked with them on an agreement that it was a pilot, and we took a co-production approach. So they actually uh, helped us shape the way that we were going to introduce the tour guide role. And one of the principles when we recruit new volunteer tour guides is they actually carry out the research and they shape the tours themselves. Because um, I don't know who here has um, experience of delivering a tour. Of course, I, I know that yourselves in the front row do, but the, the, the best way to do it is to have ownership of it and it to be a topic that you really enjoy yourself. Um, so our volunteer, as I say, they carry out the research and then the scripts get uh, looked at and um, signed off by interpretation uh, and collections colleagues and our cultural resources colleagues just to make sure everything is actually you know, accurate and as we would like. And it's about added value, so it wouldn't be something you would read in the guidebook or in the, the normal interpretation panels. So the one at Duff House goes out around the grounds and then into other areas of the house that if you didn't go on that tour, you wouldn't necessarily know about that as part of your visit. And you can see uh, Susan there, that's one of our tour guides at Dumbarton. And that's just to give you an indication throughout the country, all of the volunteers, they wear the same clothing. That's purple velvet from our colour palette. Um, and all the volunteers, they fed back that, that you know, they, they like that. That's nice. Um, it's, it's identifiable. It's quite cheery. Um, you know, it's a nice colour uh, for men or women to wear. Um, so everybody has that same um look this, this sort of same team and it differs them as well from the staff uniform in terms of being identifiable. Phase two, this is event volunteers. Has anyone here been an event volunteer before? No? Okay. If you haven't done event volunteering um, and you do enjoy events then I would recommend um, being part of it um, if you do enjoy volunteering and an extra bit of responsibility getting a little bit of the excitement from behind the scenes. Event volunteering is a really great way to do it. It might just be half a day um, to go along to the event um, and get involved that little bit more in depth. So um, our event volunteers have been running for three years and on the back of the Commonwealth Games and the Olympics in London, um, Volunteer Scotland fed back to us that there wasn't actually activities at heritage events. So lots of different events you could volunteer but not really in the historic environment. So we decided that as part of a pilot the second phase would be to introduce the event volunteers. And again, it was a good way to introduce, uh, introduce the volunteers out at the properties. Again, thinking about the staff not feeling too uh, threatened you know, by that. Um, and so that's been very successful and the numbers are growing year on year. And next year for 2018, we'll be working with the Police Scotland Youth Volunteers to engage their volunteers at our events as well as our adult volunteering. So um, if you haven't given it a go, then I would absolutely recommend that. So um, can anybody name the abbeys here? Which one do you think is that in the top right hand corner? So that's Melrose? What about this one? That's Jebra? Not now, did you? No, but that's Jebra. That's Jebra, yeah. So, when we did the third phase, which was the site based volunteers in terms of the pilot, one of the principles was voluntary participation by all staff teams. So, we wrote out to all the staff sites and we said, Does anyone want to be part of this pilot to engage volunteers? So, nobody was dictated to that they would have volunteer programs introduced. So it was about, do you want the professional development opportunity of becoming a volunteer coordinator, if that's a new skill that you want? Um, 
uh, you appreciate the value and the added value of the volunteers and also you have a strong passion for the community engagement side of things. And it was really lucky that all the sites came back to us, gave us a brilliant geographical spread and they gave us a brilliant spread of the different types of monuments. So castles, abbeys, military defences, all came in historic houses from different parts of the country, which was fab. Um, up in the top right hand corner here, this is a volunteer, he does meeting, greeting and tour guides and he retired uh, a few years ago. When he retired he said, if there's ever opportunities to come back and volunteer, I'd absolutely love to do that. So he was one of the first people to get on board with the pilot and he recently fed back that he just loves it because he has an absolute passion for Melrose Abbey but it was time to retire. Uh, and you don't want to necessarily just come back and be visitor, you know. Um, he's incredible knowledge about the site, absolute passion for it and loved talking to the visitors. That was one of his favourite things about his role. So now he comes back, he volunteers, it's flexible, comes when he wants to, can he leave when he wants to uh, and when he wants to have a break he can when he wants to. So absolutely, um, you know, suits him. Um, this is a husband and wife here at Melrose Abbey. Um, she saw the advert in the local supermarket, I believe, for the tour guide's role, thought it's not for me, uh, but my husband might be interested in it. So took the details back. He became a volunteer, went back, told her all about it, and then she decided she was intrigued, applied herself, applied herself, and they now do a joint tour of the museum that they've researched themselves, and they do it now together jointly, and they absolutely love it um, as a activity as a couple. So castles. Anybody? Gosh, <laughs> Threve. Threve Castle? Anyone? Oh no. Craig Nessing Castle? This one? Like White Ness Castle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one? Is that the one near Perth? No. no. Further north. Further north, of course. Not as far as Inverness. That's That's Huntley Castle. Okay. What about this one? Do you recognise these cannons? No. No, it's not like that. No. No. Uh, Dumbarton. Yeah. Okay. So again, that's a nice spread, geographically wise. Um, this tour here at Dumbarton, visitors have fed back that one of the great things about the tour at Dumbarton is it finishes up here at the top of the castle, and the guides talk about the wider Western Dumbarton area. So it's not just about focusing on the site, it's talking about the wider heritage of the area. So the visitors will come, they'll learn more about that, and it's the personal experience, because a lot of the guides are local. Uh, they might have grown up there, or they might have um, moved there or married into um, that area, and so they're able to talk about that wider heritage, Denny Tank, etc., of that area, and inspire visitors if they already haven't planned their journey, might go to other areas. And that's some of the volunteers from Dumbarton there on a day out there to Stirling Castle, and they got their own private tour there from one of our costumed interpreters at Stirling. At um, Blackness Castle, we are trialling a gardener's role there. Now, we were going to, as part of the pilot, do uh, more volunteer gardeners, but actually one of the agreements that was with the unions is that our volunteers don't do something that is a core part of a staff member's job description, so we don't have volunteer tour guides, for example, at Edinburgh Castle or Stirling Castle, because we actually employ guides there. And the gardeners, it's in um, our conservation colleagues, their job descriptions to actually do the gardening, but the, one of the people at Blackness Castle wanted the development opportunity. Um, and so we agreed that we would trial it there and the gardeners are actually designing a Outlander themed garden so watch this space in the spring to see what's happening at that site uh, military defences Fort George. Fort George. Okay, so Fort George, uh, we have volunteer tours there that are themed on the religious history and context of the site and also about the wildlife within the fort um, and in the surrounding areas. So again, the tours are designed for people's interests. Um, you know, they do their own research um, and, and areas of interest. What about this one here on the right, those two? Anyone? So that's Hackness Battery and Martell Tower, so that's on Hoy, um, and we have been unsuccessful, it's a population of 400 in Hoy, so we've been unsuccessful thus far in recruiting, but we will persevere, um, we're in no rush. Okay, so uh, back to Duff House again, 
<coughs> that is a gentleman who is a volunteer musician. So again, that's another uh, new role that we want to build on that. Um, he is a graded pianist, uh, has experience of playing in public, and he comes in every couple of Sundays and he plays that grand piano in the house to visitors. Um, and I've been told that there's been scenes of, of visitors coming in and actually dancing in the room amongst the paintings as he plays the piano. Now, don't worry, it's all risk assessed. And we do have staff members in each of the rooms. So <laughs> in terms of the, the preservation and the conservation site, all of that is actually assessed, of course, and, and monitored. But um, I just think that that's uh, fantastic. Um, and he loves coming in and doing that. And our cultural resources colleagues research that to get um, musical scores that would have been played in the house historically. So everything does link back into um, actual factual history and heritage of the sites. Oh, well, that one tells you which one it is there, Stanley Mills. And so that's a lady who, she runs uh, sewing classes and everything that we do is part of added value. So everything is included in the admissions cost to the sites. So you can come in and you can do sewing classes. You can do a drop-in one or um, over a couple of different weeks. And she said that she simply would like to pass on her skills of sewing to the local community. That's something new, so there's only been a couple of sessions. But we've also recruited one of her friends, that's through word of mouth, um, one of her friends who also does sewing. So next season, we are absolutely hoping to do more of those classes. And it's working with cottons as well, because Stanley Mills was a cotton mill. So visitor evaluation. Uh, they brought the story of the site to life, brilliant addition. He brought the history and place alive of the stories, 10 out of 10 for a job well done. That's from Huntley Castle. I would like to see volunteers at more sites. So as an organisation, what more could we want than that type of feedback? The volunteers really seem to be to love sharing their knowledge and took their time with each person, even though there was a line of people. So that's from the event volunteering. <clears throat> and quite a lot of feedback is coming back that something that people really like about engaging with the volunteers is the personal touch. And the volunteers, because they have their one uh, core focused area, they aren't thinking about retail, they aren't thinking about admissions, that sort of thing. So they can take the amount of time that the visitors uh, uh, need to, to spend with the volunteers. So uh, building on a foundation, um, what's next for us in terms of uh, where we are in our volunteer journey? So wanted to increase the sites, roles and inclusions. So uh, thinking about diversifying the audience uh, of volunteers. Um, and that's both individuals and working with more groups who are already engaging volunteers. So an example there might be uh, Pass for All, for example. So that is a big network of health walks that are voluntary-led, volunteer leaders. So some of our sites have great green space. Could we work with Pass for All to engage um, more of those volunteers? And also um, look at the types of roles. So Gaelic-speaking volunteers, for example, um, you know, building on these sorts of things um, and increasing our sites. So we will do another round of work with the staff properties to say, you know, we've piloted it. This is how it's working uh, at other sites. Your colleagues get their feedback. Would anybody else like to come forward and get involved? So supporting and forming wider policy and strategy. So as an organisation, we'll be working on a, a framework and refresh of our policy and strategy as we move forward and do more on the, the topic. Increased use of technology, so that's really looking um, behind the scenes in terms of um, data, database management, digital, all these sorts of things, is how can we get better at it and in terms of actually engaging the volunteers through digital technologies. Volunteer insights, so we'll do another round of consultation with the volunteers. How are we doing? Um, after our pilot. Team HES, so sometimes you think, well, um, did anyone walk across the bridge, the Queensbury Bridge, when it was opened? No? No? So I went across there, I walked across that with my dad, and it was the um, event ambassadors, and they were called event ambassadors, and they weren't called volunteers. It's a bit like the Commonwealth Games, the Glasgow Clydesiders, or at the Olympics, it was the Games Makers. So it's really thinking about what could we do more for all of our volunteers to feel part of a really big team, um, all with a shared passion, and, and how can we really foster that um, in terms of enthusiasm, and really making sure that we keep up um, in inclusion and absolutely part of the, the wider culture of the organisation, and what sort of award programmes and events can we feed into, you know, local volunteer um, centres, heritage awards, to celebrate the volunteers and the achievements. We don't have a programme ourselves as an organisation, so how can we uh, feed into what's happening locally? So I talked about this at the start. 
our place and time. Who's aware of our place and time? Yeah? Okay, so that's the, the strategy um, for the historic environment. And so it's worth, uh, if you've not already, having a look on our website and reading through that strategy. So there's a specific volunteering group for our place and time in terms of driving forward outcomes from that research piece um, and looking at the strategy across the sector. <coughs> Heritage Volunteer Organised in Scotland, so that's a hashtag campaign um, that we designed. Again, there's some familiar faces in that line up there. So we've used that to um, tie in the activity we've been doing throughout Year of History, Heritage and Archaeology and onwards. Um, into your young people um, thinking about things like youth engagement, digital engagement, succession planning, these sorts of things. So if you haven't already, go on to the HVOS website, sign up for the newsletter, get involved with us. We'd absolutely love to have you on board. Um, and Volunteer Scotland, as an organisation, we have a very good uh, relationship with Volunteer Scotland. Absolutely crucial, again, the, the collaboration. Um, we were the, the part of volunteer, the Stirling Volunteer Festival. We had an event at the Engine Shed. So again, it's about what sort of sector activity can you get involved in to celebrate and bring more and more um, opportunities to the volunteers, share resources, share ideas. And that's just some organisations along the bottom there that we may have had knowledge exchange with um, and again, working uh, towards 2018. So some partners there. <coughs> <clears throat> so I've got a film to finish up on. So this is a film, um, some of you in the room here might actually see yourselves on this film. Um, this was made from the Celebrating Volunteers Symposium that we held as part of um, the HVOS network at the museum on Chambers Street in June. <laughs> Absolutely, completely inspiring. Completely inspiring, yeah. So, just a quote there to end on. Each event is different in scale and content, so volunteering is a fresh experience every time. The staff and public couldn't be nicer towards the volunteers, and at the end of the day, it's that reception that keeps me coming back for more. So, our principles as an organisation, our volunteers are happy, our staff are happy, our visitors are happy. We have a quality programme, and that's what we want to build on, and that is our principles. Okay, so if anybody does want any more information, um, wants to get in touch to, to uh, discuss more about what we're doing, please do take down my email. Um, the research piece, you can get that from our website um, and also just more about any volunteering opportunities. So, thank you very much for listening to that. Now, um, does anyone have any questions at the moment?